Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hello, PayPod listeners. Scott here with you again. And get ready for another quality episode of PayPod, the payments and fintech podcast. When it comes to any business or brand, the communication side of it matters. How and what the employees, customers, and importantly, public hears from a business can shape the trajectory of that business. This is true for fintechs and payments organizations as well. So today, we want to take a step back and explore communication strategies for them. Not every industry is the same. Not every business is the same. So it's going to be interesting to find out just what your company is doing well, or more importantly, could be doing better. Joining me to help shed some much-needed light on this is two guests from a financial communications agency by the name of Vested. Ishveen Aurora is the COO of Vested, and Bina Kim is the president of Vested. Both women have a tremendous amount of experience in communications consultancy, particularly with financial services brands. So we're very lucky to have them on the show today. Let's jump right in. Ishveen, Bina, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. Great to be on. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me. To start us off, can you each just share a little bit about your career, your background, what led you to Vested? Sure. Um, so I'll I'll jump in first here, and <laughs> Ishvina and I are probably going to have similar backgrounds because we spent so much of our career working together, which you know I think is part of the the founding story of Vested. But um, I started my career in finance. Actually, I started my career in marketing at, at Merrill Lynch before the investment management division got acquired by BlackRock. But I've had the pleasure of working with finance brands, both big and small, from institutions to small fintech brands you've probably never heard of, or even before fintech really became its own buzzword. Um, and I've had the opportunity to to see the evolution of the space through various financial crises and also just to see how marketing communications is evolving, um, which is much of the reason why we started Vested, actually, Ishmi and I together and our other co-founder, Dan Simon, um, is because we saw that evolution happening and we saw that opportunity to, to partner up with great innovative brands across both traditional financial services and, and fintech and really help our clients tell better stories. So I'll turn it over to Ishveen to, to give a bit on her background. Thanks, Bina. I actually started my career off at an investor relations firm. Uh, but what I will say is that I always knew I wanted to work in communications. I just never thought that I would want a career in finance. But I learned very early on in my career that that was actually a space that I was really passionate about. So that's how I started in communications and then finance and then worked at an agency, like Bina said, with Dan and Bina for a really long time, where we were focused on finance. The other thing that I would add just around launching Vested is in addition to being, you know, super nerdy and passionate about the space, <laughs> right with fintech a few years ago, and, you know, really recognizing that the finance industry had an opportunity to be more creative and to think outside the box. We also, I think, recognized the ability to address talent and the way, you know, we, we thought about hiring and bringing on the best talent. And, and that meant doing things differently. I think, you know, there was definitely a different generation. And so kind of tapping into people's true entrepreneurial spirit and really enabling and empowering people to be real owners in the business. So I think that's another part of, you know, what led us to launch Vested. In addition to, I would say, I love, you know, saying we had our Jerry Maguire moment where we all sort of picked up the fish and walked out. (laughs) Right, right. I love it. I love it. And I love so many stories of folks taking their experience and then saying, hey, there's a hole here. This is something that we could fit a need. This is something maybe we could do better. We could help the industry. We could help businesses. And then just going for it. And that's exactly what Vested has done. For those who may be unfamiliar, can you just give us a little more specifics on, you know, what Vested does in the world of, you know, financial communications, marketing? What kind of services do you offer? and, And what types of organizations do you tend to serve? Who are we talking about here? 
Sure. So Vested is an integrated communications agency. We're focused on financial services and fintech. So over the last 15 years, we've really worked with financial brands, both big and small, helping them, you know, across a variety of um, different parts of communications, whether that's branding, messaging, marketing, PR, crisis communications. And the way we think about that is really across, you know, earned, owned, paid and shared channels. So just in terms of examples of the kinds of firms we work with. So, you know, asset managers, hedge funds, broker dealers, exchanges, and then a lot of the the fintech companies we spoke about earlier, as well as knowing that technology has kind of reshaped how people work and communicate. Um, We're actually the only agency that had created and developed its own proprietary technology platform, and that's quoted. And that's really a, a tool and research which connects reporters and expert sources. That's fantastic. And I think it's a perfect segue into what we want to talk about today, which is communication strategies for fintechs. And really, you know, any organization in finance, I think, can get some great takeaways here, whether they're, you know, a large payments organization, a company that's developed a new financial app, or anything in between. So, first, I love to set the stage. Let's dive in with a high level question. Why is a comprehensive communication strategy crucial for fintechs or payments businesses wanting to grow and succeed? Or put it in another way, why does communications matter? Yeah, I can jump in on that one initially, and I'm sure you're going to have color to add here. But I'm sure, Scott, you know this as well as we do. It's a, it's a pretty crowded space. And I think <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, if you just talk about payments alone, I mean, the ecosystem of payments players from you know merchant services, contactless, people who are providing the rails. I mean, there are just so many people in the space. And then when you think about big tech also jumping into the space, in addition to incumbent players, it's really easy to get lost in that noise. And when I think about communications, I think about it as not just telling a story, because I think it's really easy for people to think about comms as, okay, I'm going to like jam out this press release, or okay, we're going to go out and talk to all the journalists in the space. I think it's really important that people think about what that story actually is. And is that story different? Is that story something that's going to mean anything to the people that you're talking about? And I think if you don't get that story right, I mean, I'm sure you've seen those like category charts, right? When you think about all the payments ecosystem players Mm -hmm. and where they fall in the category. And the thing that I most often hear from people is, I feel like people don't understand our category. And I always say it's because either you haven't defined the category correctly, or we need to try and kill the category, which is really hard. And I think communications plays a really important role in defining who you are, where you sit in the landscape. And if you are trying to step outside of the category, that takes a lot of really hard communications work, but it is possible. So I would say don't underestimate the power of crafting the story. And then obviously how you tell that story and where you tell it is just as important. Yeah. And I would just add to that. I think, you know, equally important is trust and building the connection. I think we've seen people trust brands that have been around for a long time and have demonstrated stability. But I think one of the most important factors that often gets overlooked is the role and how communications can build trust. And that's even more crucial in an industry like finance, right? Because it involves financial matters. It involves people trusting you with their money. And then I think connection, you know, when communicating, whether it be your investors, your customers, regulators, partners, or even the media, you know, there's so many different constituencies that make up the growth of a company and a business. So constantly thinking about what and how you're communicating to these audiences really matters. I think that's such a great point, and Ishveen, especially the the trust aspect, and we'll get into that a bit later, but I think it is just uh, such a crucial, crucial thing So, okay, we've outlined its importance. Hopefully folks listening uh, are on the same page now. But then the next question becomes, how do we succeed? I think that financial communication strategies and goals might vary significantly based on the size of an organization and the visibility of a brand. I know Vested has worked with some really great and well-known financial organizations, Morgan Stanley, American Express, Morningstar, uh, Finastra, Mm -hmm. just to name a few. But there are also many smaller brands in the financial world. So I'm curious, how do strategies tend to differ, if at all, 
based on just the pure size of a business, established brand versus an up and comer? Yeah, it's such a good question, Scott. And it's funny. I don't know if this is the right analogy, but to me, it really reminds me of what a lot of my older friends have said when we talk about kids. So, you know, people with older children always tell me big kids, big problems, little kids, little problems. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways that applies with, uh, you know, in every situation, Um, whether you're a big bank, for example, you're going to be under a lot more scrutiny than say a smaller firm that's coming to market. So I think with smaller firms, of course, the challenge is a bit different because they are, they're at a different stage of their growth. And usually it's about raising brand awareness or going after a capital raise that could be actually be helping the firm, you know, officially launch, for example. But our approach is actually very similar in that for both, we see ourselves as business consultants because we really understand the space and our sort of, you know, our deep rooted financial expertise is what helps us be able to come at it from a different angle and keep kind of our client's business goals in mind. And while that's going to be different, of course, for a big firm versus a small firm, I think we still need to get at the heart of what our client's challenges are in order to recommend a communication strategy that's going to help them solve and address those challenges. And I'm sure Bingham has something to add there as well. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd add is big companies are under a huge amount of scrutiny and they have a lot more variables that they've got to deal with. But they also have the benefit of usually larger scale resources. And I I think the hard thing for smaller brands is they have to run a lot more lean and mean typically, which means smaller budget, smaller teams, but big company appetites, right? And so part of the work that I think we have to do with clients that are newer entrants into this space is actually try and help them figure out not how much they want to do, but actually what little they want to do and how to do that, those few choice activities really, really well. Because I think where I've seen companies, you know, probably crash and burn a little bit more is they bite off more than they can chew. And they're investing marketing and comms dollars at a really fast clip and they burn through that money really fast and the board turns around and goes, okay, well, that clearly isn't working. So you need to reinvest that money differently. And I always say, really think about how you're investing the dollars, how you're investing time and energy, prioritize activities, put some stuff in the parking lot and really measure the ROI of what you are doing so that you can scale, gain confidence from your investors and the executive team and scale after that. But um, I always say you've got to prioritize from the get-go. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Do fewer things really well and scale from there. I think that's a great point. I mean, bang for your buck. I've worked in small businesses my whole career. And that's one of those the biggest things, especially as a marketing guy, you know, if I come come to the partners with a project, the question is, is okay, what's the return on this and, and how soon can we see it? So I think I want to keep going with the, the idea of the little guy because there's so many great fintechs out there that are still growing, but they're just simply not as well known, or maybe they're basically unknown. They're trying to get established. They're trying to build that awareness. Maybe they're a new mobile bank trying to uh, attract new customers. Maybe they're a new payments company trying not to only attract merchants, but you know, establish new partnerships and things like that. What are some of maybe the specific strategies the little guy can consider in order to raise their profile and grow that awareness which in turn could have these massive benefits from a growth standpoint. Put another way, we were talking about bang for your buck or, or, or what have you. Where can that come specifically? Yeah, the hard thing in this space, as you know, Scott, is typically people in the space, their their platforms are actually pretty complex. So it's not like they offer a single widget and that's all that they do. Oftentimes, right. the clients in the space, they have pretty variated businesses that often meet the needs of different types of companies across the space of smaller merchants, larger merchants, um, et cetera. I always say it's really hard, but especially if you're a new entrant or a little guy in your words, I think you've got to define what that killer app is. And that killer app may be one thing out of a hundred that your company actually does. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it from an external in standpoint, if what you say is so broad and so umbrella like it's really hard for people to pinpoint okay well why why is what you do different or what makes you different than anybody else and so if you think about 
media stories or things that people latch onto, it's like the one really cool differentiated thing that you do. And that actually starts to define the rest of your offering. And so I always say we have to think about what the killer app is. And if we can't figure out what that killer app is, or it doesn't appear that there is one, then then we have to focus on really telling the story about how we're transforming our customers' lives or businesses. And that has to also be meaningful. So we either have to do a lot of work in sort of looking at data, finding ways to prove the value and the, the business case for what we're doing, or we have to be able to tell a really great story about what that killer feature is. I would say if we can do one or both of those things, that's when I think the little guy stands a much greater chance of being able to break through. Absolutely. Kind of keeping our focus on these lean and mean startups, you were talking about the app or or maybe the specific value that could help them break through. There's maybe a small brand, much newer and, and all of that, but they one day could be absolutely huge. Think Venmo before it became Venmo, PayPal before it was PayPal. Obviously, strategies shift as a company scales, but I'm curious, is there groundwork that smaller organizations can and should be doing with their messaging so that should everything that they want to have happen happens and the spotlight really shines on them and they blow up, they'll be ready for it? Yeah. And I think, Scott, we kind of just touched on this, you know, when Bina was talking about laying that groundwork and and making sure, you know, if you know what that killer app is, how are you differentiating yourself and how are you talking about, you know, how are you talking about it to that audience? To be honest, a company's message messaging will evolve, right? So before right. pay or Venmo became so successful, they likely had a different strategy and messaging in place. I think the common thread here is actually having and respecting the function of communications, which if brands can do that in their early stages, that's where they can really you know, have an impact and hit the ground running because I can't tell you how many firms actually underestimate the importance of it at that early stage. So I think having this function work closely with the business is really going to help ensure that a company's always ready for whatever might come their way, you know, even if it needs to evolve and be tweaked along the way. Sure. So just growing lockstep with their communication strategy and just being aware of it from the get-go is is just crucial, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing I'll I'll add to that is one thing that's getting more important is actually evaluating all the different communications touch points that a company has with an audience. Because I think, you know, oftentimes people think, okay, what am I putting on my website or what did I put on my press release? But actually, I think it's about the emails you choose to send. It's about when a customer calls in or is on a chat with the customer support team, what is that person saying back? What are some of the staffers and executives saying on their personal social media channels? And if you think about communications and if you think actually about where some brands have actually gotten into hot water, it's not usually about what someone put on the website. And typically the stuff that gets posted on a website is like triple checked by all these different people. It's the off the cuff comment that an executive made in poor taste on Facebook. It's, right. you know, something inappropriate or even rude that was said in a customer service setting. And I think in many ways, we have such a very visible communications universe around us where so many conversations are happening simultaneously. And I think in many ways that makes the the role of comms that much harder is because we have so many places that we have to think about. But I think especially for a startup, they have to evaluate all the communications vehicles that are going out and making sure that across the company, it's not just the marketers, it's not just the communicators, but it is sales, customer service. It's the leadership team, it's the people, it's staff members themselves, that they are all on the same page and understand that every word does matter, especially in this kind of environment. I think every word is even that much more powerful. So I always say, don't underestimate that um, as a small brand. I think big companies know that very well because uh, they, <laughs> right. they have so many firewalls in place and they don't even let you access social media from you know your, your company computer typically. But I think that is something that sometimes smaller companies underestimate is um, how important and powerful every communications can be in, in both good and bad ways. I think it's a fantastic point. And, and I'm just thinking about the fact that someone saying something, maybe if you're a smaller firm, you kind of don't think it's that big of a deal, or you're kind of like, mm, maybe this isn't the best, but we aren't going to worry about it now. But then, you know, you look down the road, 
months and months and you've grown and now the the spotlight is much bigger on your brand, that one thing that wasn't quite a big deal now becomes a big deal. Exactly. On this show, and I think this is actually a good segue to this question, we've talked a lot about things like security and privacy, which I think fintechs are on the forefront of driving innovation and standards in. You know, customer trust has to be through the roof if you're talking about handling credit card data, bank accounts, Bitcoin wallets, and so on. Naturally, as hard as businesses, be they payments companies, banks, financial service organizations, or otherwise, work to protect that data and combat would-be cyber criminals, breaches happen. Sometimes things just go wrong and the negative impact is immediate, especially when we're talking about this trust. What do you think are some of the keys to successfully navigating the dreaded PR nightmare, so to speak, for fintechs finding themselves in that kind of situation? Yeah, I think that's such a great question, Scott, and a really important issue. Um, My first piece of advice is to never claim that it can't happen to you. I think two quick firms kind of shout from the rooftops when their competitors find themselves in that situation. And, you know, I'd actually say that's a mistake because cybersecurity, it's a huge issue. And we've seen from other firms that have been targeted that it really can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. Not to say that firms, you know, shouldn't highlight all they're doing in the space and the investments that they're making to ensure something like this doesn't happen. But I think it can always, you know, it, it ultimately comes back to your communication strategy. And in this case, I would say over communicating. So, you know, one were to find themselves in that PR nightmare, I think, you know, start by fact gathering and ensure you have all your ducks in a row over communicate with the clients, even if it's, you know, a holding statement to tell them you're investigating the situation while you're, you know, getting all your ducks in a row. And I truly believe that transparency and honesty goes a long way, especially with building customer loyalty and that trust we talked about earlier, because once you lose a customer or a client's trust, it's very hard to get it back. So I think it's really about focusing on being transparent and coming up with, you know, solutions to address the problems and not excuses. Yeah, I was going to add that I think for for anyone who's listening to this podcast right now, I think, you know, don't wait for the nightmare to happen, you know, prepare, I would say prepare, Mm -hmm. prepare, prepare, right? The unfortunate reality is it's, it's a matter of when, not if, like something is going to happen. And I always say it's like a fire drill. You want to make sure that the moment you smell smoke, everyone knows what to do. If you smell smoke and everybody's sitting around going, is that smoke? What should we do? Should we sit here? Should we, who do I talk about this? No, you smell smoke and everybody knows exactly what to do. And I think similarly for any company, no matter the size, they have to know exactly what actions they need to start to kick into play when that crisis hits. Because those first few hours after the crisis happens are typically what make or break the outcome from that crisis. Did it get resolved? Do people feel comfortable? Did we show people that we are in control? But if everybody's running around like chickens with their heads cut off, we're going to lose ourselves to the crisis. And so I always say, and I think some of the work that we do with our clients is making sure you've got the paybook in place. And we've even done sort of scenario testing where we'll kind of put on a fake crisis and put everybody through the through the drills and getting that practice under our belt. So I always say, if you have the time and the energy, prepare, do the playbook, practice the drills. Um, because that is actually what's going to prepare you for whatever that potential PR nightmare might be. I love that. The fire drill, right? It makes so much sense to me that the worst thing could be no one having any plan, and then the crisis happens, and then you have people going in all these different directions, and that's how messages get muddled and the brand starts to get hurt, potentially. Exactly right. I want to shift to, I guess, a current topic, COVID-19. It has caused tremendous turmoil for many industries and, you know, finance is no exception. From the payment side, some companies have really had to make some tough decisions, you know, passing higher pricing onto merchants due to risk. Meanwhile, some fintechs have had to make difficult decisions with downsizing their workforce. Add in all of the uncertainty with where everything is headed, you know, even with things reopening, Saying this is challenging from a communication standpoint feels like a a tremendous understatement. What advice or thoughts might you have for businesses and payments and fintech 
who want to connect with their customers, provide assurance with their company direction, and really navigate all of this effectively with their messaging? Are there specific strategies you've seen companies following as it relates to this pandemic that really seem to be resonating? What's your take? And I'm so glad you asked about this, Scott, because I think it certainly has been a challenging period. It's something that we're actually helping quite a lot of our clients get through right now, just you know, particularly given how much uncertainty that still lies ahead. I think that being said, firms that have, have been the most successful are really those that are, again, over-communicating, being transparent, but also thinking about how can they evolve their products or their solutions to really meet the current needs of their customers. In communicating with your customers, I think it's important to remember not to be tone deaf, right? The last thing you want to be doing is sending out a press release around a product launch, you know, when you don't know what's happening on the other side of your, mm-hmm. your final customer, just through this very uncertain period. But perhaps, you know, you've been able to offer a new service now virtually, or maybe you're offering digital capabilities in an effort to not interrupt service to your customers. So I think that's something that likely addresses a need that they have in this current environment. So I think really being in tune with those needs. I think also just making sure, you know, your content is up to date and reflects what's going on in the world. I think when you go to someone's website, you do want to see something that talks about COVID and it doesn't mean you need to suddenly be the expert on on it, but just addressing and recognizing it and making sure that your content around it is up to date and that you have a point of view or just be mindful that your messaging, you know, reflects what's happening around us. And then I'd say, finally, make it a two-way dialogue. Talk to your customers, your investors, your partners. Again, going back to thinking about all of those constituencies because they do matter and so not being afraid to have an open discussion about how you can work together in order to be successful. I think that's fantastic advice. And I really like your point about just kind of speak to it on some level, because I think, and this is just me coming from the merchant services side, I think some of the challenges many merchants have had is is the uncertainty and not knowing exactly, you know, is my payments going to be affected? Is this going to impact my business? And even having some kind of something that speaks to that can at least soothe some of those fears and at least give a cleaner picture to your merchants and things like that. So I think it's crucial. Exactly. I'm a marketing guy. So I'm curious to your thoughts on social media for fintech brands. We kind of were touching on it a little bit earlier. I find that on this very show, sometimes featured organizations are on everything. Sometimes it's just Twitter. Sometimes they have a random YouTube channel with like one video. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, you know, it's, it's Instagram. Do you think that any fintech should be on as many of the significant social media platforms as they can be on? Are there some platforms that tend to be better for finance industry businesses than others? Is no account better than an inactive account? I'm just curious on your perspective, especially as folks might be listening and thinking, what can I do to be better? Yeah, it's a great question. And to be honest, there isn't really a right or wrong answer. I think it's not like, okay, I'm going into fintech and I definitely need to be on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. The important thing to start off with social media is that not every platform is created equally. So Twitter Mm -hmm. is not equal to LinkedIn, is not equal to Instagram, is not equal to YouTube. They all have a different purpose and oftentimes a different audience. And also the reason why people use those channels is different. So just because people use Instagram for leisure, people use LinkedIn for business. And so that should actually shift what you're communicating about on those channels too. The other thing that I always encourage companies to think about is social media is not a, just a push mechanism. And that's really important because I think in financial services, there's obviously a heightened focus on control and compliance. And that sort of comes at odds sometimes with the fact that social media is really about conversations. It's not just about, I'm going to push out my corporate messaging. It's about having conversations with your customers and with the world at large. And you have to go into social media being prepared to have a conversation. I think if you're in the B2C space, obviously, I think 
in many ways that opens up more opportunities to engage directly with your end customer, whether it's like a millennial or a Gen Xer. But if you're a B2B company, I think one of the bigger challenges is typically the buyers are executives. They're people who are making large decisions for for larger companies. And so are they going to Facebook to think about purchasing a, a very expensive piece of software kit, for example? Probably not, which is why I think for the B2B space in particular, you have to think about every channel and what they're for. LinkedIn is great for networking and prospecting. Facebook is great for HR purposes. Twitter is great for media and news engagement. So I always say evaluate what channels, what you're going to use them for, and go into every single one knowing that you are going to have a two-way conversation. And to your point, I do think it is better to have no account than to have an inactive one. And I always say before any of my clients starts a social media channel, I always say, it's like you're giving birth to something and now you have to keep it alive from here on out. Because right. from here on out, if if you just let that baby die out there, it's not going to look good for your business. To your point, like a YouTube channel with one video does not look good. It kind of looks like you're not growing or thriving as a business. I always say, be ready, know what you're getting yourself into, be prepared to constantly feed this channel, but it can provide a huge amount of ROI if you know what you're doing. Yeah. So social media is definitely one of those things that I think you cannot force on an organization or its peoples. You either need to find the advocates within the organization who understand, I think, the importance of the engagement, or you outsource it as many of our clients do with us in order to be consistent and effective. Love it. Okay. This is, we're at the part of the show where I kind of turn our focus to the future. So if you guys could peer into the crystal ball what do you see in the future for Vested? Any specific products, services, partnerships, or otherwise on the horizon that you can share that our listeners might find to be interesting? Yeah, I mean, I think Ishvi and I are probably going to say, you know, we're focused on um, total world domination. But uh, <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, we're expanding. And I think, you know, we are a bit different than other agencies. Like we're not just a marketing communications agency. To Ishvi's earlier point, we created our own tech platform called Quoted. We acquired a media business called Talking Biz News. We acquired a content studio called Scribe. I think really what we think about is, okay, what are the challenges financial firms and fintech companies face and how can we solve them better? And that's going to come in non-traditional ways, which means we're always on the hunt for looking at diversifying our services and our product suite. We're looking at geographic expansion. So today we have offices in New York, London, Toronto, San Francisco, but we've got our eyes set on, set on other markets too. And honestly, I'm excited about, I think, what the future holds, not only for Vested, but I think the field of marketing communications and also for financial services and fintech at large. And I think all the global forces at play right now are going to accelerate change in ways that I think will be really meaningful for Vested, but I also think for our, for our industry at large. I love it. All right. We have a segment that we like to end with on every show. It's five questions. It's rapid fire. Uh, one or both of you can feel free to jump in on any question you feel you want to answer. Ishveen, Bina, are you ready? Should we be scared? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a little scared, just a little bit. <laughs> All right. Number one, make a prediction about the future of communications as a field that you expect will happen in the next 12 to 24 months. I don't know if it's so much of a prediction, but I, I think going back to social media, I actually think social media channels will continue to have a major impact in how news is digested and how brands are communicating. What's one cool piece of payment or finance related technology that you've come across recently unrelated to your company that impressed you? I mean, I'm personally slightly obsessed with like e-commerce and retail tech. So I think the transformation of how we shop and pay for things is going to be huge. I mean, you know, if you've been in New York and you've ever been in like one of the Amazon Go stores, I think the idea of how our lives are going to change by just being able to walk in and out of stores without ever having to touch anything really, I think mm -hmm. um, is going to be transformative and really important at a time when I think retail is under pressure. So I think all of the cool technologies that are coming out with like smart mirrors, contactless, but also, you know, people list checkout experiences are really exciting and are going to change how we, how we live. In the next five years, most people around the world will make a purchase with either Bitcoin, Alipay, Apple Pay, some other thing. Which one and why? 
So I was going to say, I, I can't side with any one of these because I don't want to disenfranchise our customers. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm not going to pick one on this one. Yeah, I wasn't going to pick one. I was going to add, I think today, look, you have Apple Pay in the US, Alipay in Asia, and they're, you know, digitized forms of how banks operate and will likely continue to grow because they already have a significant market share. But if you ask kind of who really has the ability to disrupt the way we make purchases in the future, then I might go with Bitcoin, just given the security it provides to its owners. I think that's a really great communications answer. I think you guys know a thing or two about communications. <laughs> What's one piece of advice you would have for someone who's considering the communications industry as a career? Internships, internships, internships. I cannot stress that point enough. It's the best way to figure out what part of communications and what industry within it um, that really excites you. Last question here, and maybe both of you can answer this because it may be different. What's the best business advice you've ever received and from whom? I think one piece of advice that's really stuck with me is actually one that we got when we first started Invested, and it was from um, Larry Tab, who has been you know, a friend of the firm for a long time. But uh, he told us it's either free or expensive. And what he meant by that is how you think about consulting generally and that you either give free advice and you provide great consult and advice to people in the space, build great relationships, garner goodwill or expensive. And what that means is don't devalue the quality and the value of the services that you provide. There isn't a middle ground there. And I, and I think that was important to us when we thought about what we were doing and the consultation that we provide and how much value that can bring to our clients that we would rather give free advice or price our services appropriately based on the ROI that we know it, it can provide. So that's really stuck with us. And I think it's been a mantra of ours when we think about you know who we are and, and what we provide to, to the industry at large. Mm-hmm. I'm um, I'm going to be sentimental here and say, you know, a piece of advice from my dad, actually, um, who basically had built his business from nothing. And he was very supportive of Vested from day one. Um, you know, he said, you should always be willing to take a risk. And if you take risks, you'll succeed. And that has always stayed with me. That's fantastic. Ishveen, Bina, I want to thank you both so, so much for joining me on the show today helping explore this. I think there's a lot of great takeaways here. And uh, it's obvious to me that you guys are doing some great things at Vested. So thank you for joining me. And before I let you go, if folks are listening and they want to connect with Vested, find out more about what you guys do, where can they go? How should they connect? Yeah, I would say um, check out our website, www.fullyvested.com. Or feel free to uh, email us at info at fullyvested.com. Thanks again. Thank Thank you so much, Scott. Well, that's it for our show today. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like what we do here, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening platform is. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod, brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. Soar.